All right, everybody. Our last presentation of the day, Mark Cooper is going to present how PKI and Shake and Stir will fix the global robocall problem. And I'm really interested in that. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I, I was uh, just telling Joe, it's, it's an amazing coincidence that over the years of speaking, somehow I always wind up in the slot that's between you and alcohol. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, so I'm painfully aware of the fact that the end of the day is after this, so I appreciate you coming. Um, so as, as uh, he read, um, this is actually a brand new topic that I'm just starting to talk about, because frankly, a lot of people um, aren't even aware that this is going on. There's a brand new change that's coming to the telecom space. Um, and the shake and stir framework is what we're going to talk about today. So my company uh, focuses just in the PK, so public key infrastructure, doing cryptography. And traditionally, that's been enterprises um, as well as a lot of IoT. Um, and this has kind of come out of nowhere. And it's an interesting topic that we started talking about uh, earlier this year simply because of the fact that's so heavily reliant on cryptography and the fact that it's affecting everybody. So today we're gonna to go through and talk a little bit about what the current landscape is. And I could probably guess this, but I'm gonna ask your cooperation on this one. How many people have gotten a robocall sometime in the last couple of days? Thanks. All right, uh, anyone gotten one today? All right, and just because of DEF CON, is anyone here actually the ones making those calls? All right, there's two. All right, so perhaps. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on. Since everyone's pretty painfully aware of what these robocalls are, we're going to talk a little bit about the scope. We don't really have to go too far into there, but we're going to talk a little bit about the motives. And the motives are really important because as we start talking about this framework, one of the areas I want to go into with you guys is the fact that um, just because there's a solution to the problem doesn't mean it's going to fix the problem and it's going to actually present a whole new set of exploits um, that people can potentially take advantage of. So we're going to talk about not just what Shake and Stir is and how it works, but we're going to talk a little bit about those technical details. Um, so depending on what side of the argument you're on, um, you can have a better understanding of how this works. So a, a couple interesting things around the robocall space. There is actually just a summit that the FCC held. Um, Chairman Ajit Patel uh, held this in DC just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, interesting set of statistics. Almost half of all phone calls that are made now are some type of robocall caller ID spoofing or something relating to that space. That's why we're getting so many of these. They've been around for a long time. Um, at one point, I took a screenshot of the voicemails on my phone a couple of days ago. Nine out of 10 of the voicemails were either a healthcare provider, IRS scam, or something else. It's now gotten to the point, like most people, if it's a number I don't recognize, I'm not even answering the phone. My phone has essentially turned into what my daughter uses the phone for email and web browsing. If someone calls me, I know it's a scam. My wife doesn't call me, my daughter doesn't call me. Well, let's not go there, that just is. But anyway, the phone calls are not doing anything good for me. The other thing that we're seeing is the vast majority of these are some type of robocall. And there are some that do a much better job than others. Probably one of the best ones I've heard is a recording and it sounds like someone who's picking up their headset and starting to talk. Most of these call systems have a, and they're just waiting for that pickup click, and then maybe they'll connect you to someone, or they'll start playing a message. But the best one, it's like, oh, hold on a second. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, this is that bank loan. So some of them are much better about how to attract you once you pick up the phone. But if you don't pick the phone, you're not going to fall prey to this. The other thing that we're seeing, and a lot of people in the U.S. don't realize, this is a global problem. This isn't just happening in the U.S. It's not just U.S. numbers that are being spoofed. It's not just U.S. phones that are being called. The calls are coming from all around the world. They're happening around the world. So they're not just coming to the U.S. or leaving the U.S. It's a global problem. The other thing that we're seeing is we're expecting a greater number of calls that are happening to mobile phones. For a long time, we were seeing a lot of the robocalls going to landlines. Well, they got smart a couple of years ago and realized they need to start using the mobile numbers. And as you probably have been painfully aware, things like do not call lists, that's essentially just a publication of your number to robocall. 
So a couple of things that are going on. When we talk about the problem, it's definitely a global issue, not just happening in the US. There's a huge impact from a cost. It may just be a few seconds of your time to determine if you want to answer the call or hang up the call. Uh, from a business perspective, that's happening over and over again. Uh, an interesting thing that's happened to me, I have a service that answers my main office number because we're often traveling, working with customers. We don't have someone sitting there at the phone. So it's provided me a really interesting data point. They charge me for every call they pick up, even if it's a robocall. So suddenly, I was able to get this nice data on, oh, look at how many calls I'm getting, look how much this is costing me. My answering calls, even though it takes them a few seconds to go, oh, solicitation, hang up, push the button, charge mark, almost doubled or tripled over periods of time. And you could see this ebb and flow where some months you can see somebody was really going at it hard on the robocall side and my service costs went up. Well, that same thing impacts businesses. If you have a receptionist that's sitting there, you have employees that are getting those calls, those fractions of minutes, fractions of, of calls add up to productivity losses. That has no um, inclusion of the financial loss. Most of those robocalls are out to get something, steal information, get you to buy something or get details from you or get some type of scam, the IRS scam, for instance. So there's money transactions in addition to these billions of dollars of loss. What we're starting to see in the US is the FCC is encouraging companies to implement stronger controls. There isn't a regulated requirement yet. We're starting to see some things at the federal level of encouraging the adaptation of authenticated calls. There is encouragement for private enterprise on the telco side to start implementing solutions. But as of today, there's no regulatory requirement that's forcing this. Fortunately, a lot of that's being driven from the fact that there is a technology standard that's coming out. We have been seeing some things uh, from the phone company perspective, you may have seen something earlier this year with Comcast and AT&T. They had put out that they started testing and implementing authenticated caller IDs. And when I get in the shake and stir, I'll, I'll show you essentially what they did. It, it's, it's not shake and stir, it's a proof of concept. So why are we here? Where, where did this problem come from? And it really goes back to the beginning of caller ID. And when caller ID was first created, uh, I believe it was invented uh, in the 60s, we really didn't see adoption in the US until the mid 80s. And the concept was that the telephone switch itself is a trusted source. The switch was at the telco. When you placed a call, that circuit ID got assigned a caller ID number that was then sent to the recipient, and that was your caller ID. It was from trusted source to trusted source. Well, with the advent of computerized PBX systems, now microcomputer-based PBX systems, that concept of trust has moved out of the telco, is now potentially in the hands of the call originator. A lot of people that are using voice over uh, IP services are acting as their own switch, which means it's now up to them to choose what caller ID they put onto their calls. So that trust source changed, but the whole concept of caller ID had no way of keeping up with that. So because of the fact that we're now allowing the originator in, in many cases with these virtual PBXs to designate their call, it's a non-trivial issue for them to change the number every call they make, every dozen calls they make, whatever process they want to go through. Very easily demonstrated. They can go through and the reason that they change their number is a very important thing. Yes, there are some tactics of having area codes and prefixes that match your number, but a lot of people have gotten smart on that. The whole reason they're doing that is to keep their line from getting flagged and blocked. A lot of the technology that's out there, you can get this from AT&T, you can get it on your mobile phones, for instance, they offer these spam blocking applications. Really all that they're doing is if a lot of people mark a particular number as being a spam call or a fraudulent or a robocall, if they get enough complaints, the intent was to block it. Well, the originator simply needs to change their number. And if it's an ever uh, revolving set of numbers, there's nothing that can be blocked. So the problem is it's kind of a cat and mouse thing. It's always moving around, it's not a consistent ID. So there's really no reliable way to block those calls and to know if it's a genuine caller or not. 
So that's where the shake and stir framework comes in. This is a global standard, and the reason that a lot of people haven't heard this is it was only recently ratified. It was uh, the end of 2018 that the standards were complete. Uh, it was created by the uh, Alliance for Telecom Industry Standards, or ATIS, and ATIS is comprised of industry bodies, so it was brought by the global telecom industry itself. And what it does is it provides a framework for authenticated caller ID. The intent is it will no longer simply be the originator of a call who happens to own a PBX. They will not be able to designate the caller ID. In addition, it provides cryptographic functions and integrity to verify all calls that are going to be made. Now, the ATIS framework itself um, has several different components that are at play, and the primary one that we're really looking at here is shaken and stir. Now, an interesting, I had a, a conversation with, with one of the principal authors a couple of weeks ago, uh, and interestingly enough, it started with stir as the original concept, and then shaken came along, and their joke was shaken, not stir, and if you're into martinis, there's another variation called lemon twist. So basically, a lot of alcoholics are getting together to try to figure out how to fix this foam problem is, is pretty much what I'm learning here. Um, ironically, we, we were drinking martinis when we were talking about this. Um, so the intent is the originating telco, not the PBX, the originating telco themselves will now be responsible for asserting the caller ID. So imagine that scenario where the switch used to be that giant box sitting inside of the telco data center that's now sitting on a computer or now sitting on some VoIP provider. The telco that places that call will now be the one responsible for asserting that caller ID, and I'll show you how that works. On the receiving side, they're going to validate that information. So shaken and stir are the two primary methods that this is going to happen. At the very center of Shaken and Stir, and the reason that this is a place that I've taken a great interest in and why it's important to us, is it's really built on PKI. And when we first got exposed to this, we had a company that came to us because we're subject matter experts in PKI. Um, and they said, we know telecom, we don't know what this PKI thing is, can you help us figure out what this is all about? Um, so the, the, the challenge of being a little bit of a crypto geek is if you have a family, sometimes you say, family, go away. I want to read something really interesting. So I spent the weekend reading through all of these standards to figure out what the heck they were doing. Now, the interesting thing is it's 99% normal PKI. So if you work with any type of public key infrastructure, you work with certificates, um, you have a concept of asynchronous cryptography, it's the same thing. They're doing some unique things in there, but the basic constraints are the same. What is essentially going to happen is by using PKI and those uh, certificates is every telco is going to either assert or validate caller ID information. The shake and stir framework defines most of the properties that are needed in this ecosystem. What types of certificates, the type of cryptography, um, how it's going to be implemented, how things are validated. There are some unique things as far as how the telcos themselves will get authenticated because their enrollment is a little non-standard. But the framework itself kind of does a good job of defining those boundaries, but there's a lot that still has to be uh, determined. With that PKI that's in place, every telco is going to be responsible for implementing this. And there are controls that help define what happens for a telco that doesn't have a PKI or they're not up to speed. The good thing is phone calls will still go through. From a consumer perspective, the bad news is phone calls still go through. And I'll show a little bit about why this is a, a transitional technology uh, that has some weaknesses in there, but still something that's gonna provide some value. Now, with shake and stir, what we're going to find is the originating telco is going to place the caller ID information into the header of each call. So if you're not already aware, the vast majority of voice calls you make, regardless of the device you use, winds up as a VoIP call. We're talking SIP communications over either closed networks or internet networks. It's all SIP communications. So if you imagine that initial header packet has information about the destination, essentially the receiving telco, in there is going to be caller ID information that's encrypted. 
Uh, in there, there's going to be a structure where each telco has a signing certificate that they control that allows them to do the signing. And then on the receiving side, the receiving telco is going to go through a validation process to actually validate that caller ID information. So this is kind of what the framework looks like. Now the challenge with shake and stir is because it's a global standard, a lot of this is left up to each country to implement. If they're going to follow shake and stir, there are certain framework things that they need to follow, but it's up to them to implement each of these components themselves. So I've, I've tried to keep this as generic across the globe as I can, but there's some of these components that are applicable to the US right now based on uh, what we're seeing. Um, at the very top, we have this concept of a policy administrator. Uh, and in the US, this is just the point that we've got right now. So at a whole, if you take this entire chart, all that we have is a company assigned as the policy administrator. Uh, what happened is there's an organization uh, created out of ATIS and the, um, I think it was the ETF, they created the STIGA. And if you want to find acronyms, ATIS and the Shake and Stir is a great place to go. Everything is three and four and five letter acronyms. Um, so at the very top is this concept of STIGA, the Secure uh, Telephone Information General Administrator. Uh, their job is to essentially be the non-government entity that is responsible for uh, secure telephony. And all that they've done essentially is put out a bid for a company to run as the policy administrator. Uh, that was won by a company called iConnective in the US. So this is an example of something that's gonna have to happen in every country. Each country is going to have to put some type of a body in place to run their shake and stir framework. Whether it's private enterprise like it is in the US or a government entity, that's going to be left up to each country. The policy administrator has a couple of important jobs. They're responsible for defining what this ecosystem is, because even though Shake and Stir has defined the technical requirements, they have left a number of things to the policy administrator to figure out. How do you determine what PKIs are trusted to do this? How do you attest and audit those PKIs to make sure that they're following the rules? Not only that, but the shake and stir framework, if you work in the PKI space, there's a common practice we go through called the certificate policy and practice statement. Well, in the shake and stir framework, there's all of about five paragraphs that say, this is the only thing we're gonna stipulate for a CPCPS, it's up to the policy administrator to figure the rest of this stuff out. So none of that has even been defined yet. So one of the biggest challenges we're having is for companies that want to get into this space, because there's a commercial play here, is what are the rules? What am I going to have to do? What are my requirements? Don't know what they are. They haven't been written yet. So the policy administrator has two main functions. One is they're going to be able to oversee the ecosystem of commercial CAs. So think of this a lot like the global signs, the DigiCerts, the GoDaddies, all of those CAs that work in a trusted root space for Windows and Linux and Macintoshes, all of those concepts have no bearing in this ecosystem. Just because a CA is trusted by Windows or um, Google, for instance, doesn't mean that they're trusted to run inside this ecosystem. Well, in order to be part of this um, framework, the policy administrator is gonna have to define those rules and allow those commercial entities to participate. The challenge right now is what are those rules and who are they gonna be? The other interesting thing about that is from a commercial perspective, if I wanna get in the business of selling certificates to do shake and stir in the US, my total customer base is 2,000. There are 2,000 telcos in the US, so how much money do I have to charge per certificate if I had 100% of the market and keep a business going? That whole financial picture hasn't been quite figured out. The other part that's here is we could also have a PKI that is within the telco itself. So we have the commercial entities, we have the originating telco, we could have the telcos themselves say, you know what, I don't want to use a third party certificate, I'm just going to stand up my own PKI. Why bother buying a cert? I'm big co, I can do it myself. Now, the same things, we don't know what the rules are, we don't know the security requirements that are going to be there, but they have that option. The challenge is in the US, maybe 10 of the telcos are big enough that they can look at that and go, 
that's inconsequential money. But the other 1,990 telcos, a lot of them are very small shops. A lot of them are virtual providers are going to be faced with how do I invest not only in the technology, but in the operations of this. So it's a big uphill battle for them. Now, within that, once we've figured out what those PKIs are going to be, what we essentially wind up with is a roadmap that looks like this. When a call is placed, it goes to the originating telco, and they have a service that is part of the shake and serve called the authentication service. And essentially what the authentication service is going to do is use existing um, customer records. We know this call is coming in on this circuit. That means this caller ID is, is assigned to that circuit. It's then going to use its key management and secure key storage. This essentially comes down to their certificate and some type of hardware security module that's protecting the key. Once they know that circuit ID, they know the telephone number associated with it, they'll use their uh, signing key, and then they will route the call out with a signed head. Here is the originator's caller ID and some additional information. Now, a couple of the interesting things that are a little different than a typical PKI is the fact that we have this concept of a certificate repository. So one of the challenges that we have when using certificates is we have to be able to validate the certificate itself. Does it come from a trusted PKI? Has it been revoked? A lot of times when we do things like TLS, we can shove all that stuff down in the negotiation of the TLS session itself. Well, from the telephony side, time is our problem. We can't send a lot of data. If we're sending all of that, it's going to increase the time to connect. So what they've done instead is they created this certificate repository which frankly isn't much more than a file repository, a copy of certificate and revocation details that are sitting there. When the call is routed, in the header it will say, here's where my repository is. So now every telco or every commercial CA will have to have a repository that can be used to retrieve certificates and revocation details to validate that header. Now, there's some really important things when it comes to caching uh, because the time to completion is a really important uh, part of all this. Once the call goes through on the receiving telco, they have to decrypt all of that. They go through a verification service, and the verification service is essentially going to validate the header, validate the signature, make sure it was a trusted PKI that signed it. They then have the caller ID, and that's what's presented to the user. So at no point did the user themselves have the opportunity to affect the caller ID. If they're running as a virtual switch or a virtual operator, they have no way of asserting that caller ID. If they put it in the call packet itself, it's overwritten by the telco itself. So it moves that concept of trust and how we define that caller ID on telco. Now our problem is how do we make sure the telcos do it the right way and securely? Now, the shake and stir, the fact that we can validate identities only solves part of the problem. All that shake and stir will do is give us consistent data. This caller making these calls got flagged X number of times as a spam call, but they're consistently on that number. Shake and stir cannot stop those calls. And in fact, calls will go through whether shake and stir is there or not. All that we're doing is providing consistent, attestable information about who is placing the call. Now, with that, Shake and Stir has provided suggestions to telcos and to handset manufacturers of how to deal with this information. There's really two things. How do you, as a receiving telco, want to deal with calls that are consistently being reported as spam? That's up to you. Do you want to just let them through and you ignore the problem? Will your consumers complain about it and ask you to do something about it? Or do you somehow provide some clues to the user about what's going on? And then the handset manufacturers have to have some way of displaying that information to you. So a couple of things that we have is the terminating network or the receiving network now has a couple of things they can bring to bear. There have been these um, uh, analytical options or CVT options to provide information about whether a call is uh, a spam call or a robocall. And you may see some of these now. I know on my phone I'll get a suspect spam or, or some other type of alert. So there is some analytics that are out there. But it's not wholly um, thorough without consistent caller ID information. But now 
those existing analytics and consistent caller IDs, now the receiving telco has options. Do we want to start marking things so that they show up differently to our user? Do we want something that comes through with no particular warning, it's just a name and a number, essentially what you see now, but doesn't necessarily assert that it's a valid name or number? Or do we only start marking things as suspect spam or invalid number? Or do we have other types of visual indicators of what things should be going on? So shake and stir doesn't fix all the elements that are there, but now give a platform where Apple and Android and everyone else could now decide, hey, how do we handle these unvalidated calls? What do we show to their users? How do we respond? So the current ecosystem itself, and, and this is kind of the challenging space. Uh, we have ADIS, it's been around for quite some time. They're responsible for helping bring together the, the authors and the concepts, and the IETF was also part of the creation of the standard. Uh, we have government entities around the world, as I said, each country is going to have to implement this in their own way. Uh, in the US, that falls under the FCC, but as I indicated, the FCC is not taking a regulatory um, approach to this quite yet. There's a lot of uh, encouragement to private enterprise to implement technologies like this. It stated, we would like this today. Well, what I'm gonna tell you is this ecosystem, if we go back to the flow, the only thing that exists is the fact that the policy administrator has been selected. We're now sitting almost in the middle of August. Nothing's getting done by the end of the year. There's a number of agencies that we're gonna see involved from a purely policy side. So the STIGA, as I mentioned, uh, the policy administrator will be specific to each country. In the US, that was awarded to iConnective. Uh, a lot of the work right now is being done at this level. Between the STIGA and their subject matter experts and the policy administrator, this ecosystem is being defined. What is it going to take to attest these PKIs? What are the operational requirements? What's the timeline? All the stuff that wasn't in the standard itself. Now beyond that, we have the telcos. Just because the framework is being stood up, it's up to each telco to decide how they're going to participate in the space. It's an it's a industry standard with no regulatory requirement, which means they can drag their feet as long as they can. There's no one that's going to shut them down if they don't do this. Now, there are some interesting thoughts around how are these companies going to be compelled to participate? If we start seeing things from a consumer perspective um, where I can get alerts that are consistently better about spam calls, that might start to influence people on what provider they go to. And it may no longer just be, can you hear me now? It's like, can you flag my spam for me now? From a business perspective, if I have a provider that's not on the shake and stir framework and my calls are consistently getting flagged as unverified, Think of it like your website if it comes up as unable to validate your certificate. Could people click through? Could they still get to the website? Yeah, maybe. But do you want that for your business? Probably not. So we may see pressure from businesses to their telco saying, I'm going to move my business somewhere else because you're not properly validating my calls on the way out. Now I'm not able to reach my customers. So we may see pressures coming from that place. Uh, and obviously, um, part of the ecosystem is going to be those handset manufacturers. I haven't seen anything from them today as far as how they're going to be participating. Now, there's obviously many more telcos than I can uh, have space for, but we are seeing early activity from uh, AT&T and Comcast, as I said. What they essentially did when they did their um, announcement earlier this year, and you can look this up, they'll say that they've implemented new authenticated caller ID systems. It's shake and stir. What they essentially did was they both created self-signed certificates and exchanged them with each other. They did the protocol, they did take that SIP header, they did encrypt it, they did put a caller ID in there and it, it completed and it was great and now they get to say they're doing authenticated caller ID. Yes, it doesn't scale, but could by the end of this year, could we take all of the major telcos in the US, the handful that there are and shrinking every day, could they all potentially do this in the short term? Yes, will it be shake and stir to the whole framework? No but they can at least start doing authenticated caller ID now. 
So what's next? Where are we in this process? If we know who these players are, we know there's a technical standard, where we're at right now is the standards themselves, the framework, how is all of this going to work is being fleshed out right now. So between the STIGA and the policy administrator for the US-based approach, that's all being figured out now. So conversations with them as they're trying to figure out what that policy is going to look like, who those players are going to be, what the options are from the telco perspective. Uh, and obviously a big part of this is how is all of this going, uh, going to be funded? If we've got a pseudo government agency that's going to be uh, supervising all of this and potentially commercial CAs that are going to be providing the certificates, who's paying for what? And that was not part of the framework. So each country kind of gets to figure out what that's going to look like. The other thing that we're seeing is we're starting to see um, um, the the peer-to-peer -peer concepts, as I said. I believe AT&T and Comcast are the only ones that have at least publicly stated that they're doing this. I wouldn't be surprised to see more of that uh, by the end of the year so that they can say that, yes, they're following FCC recommendations and they're doing this. After that evolution, we're going to be moving into the deployment. Once that operating uh, set of policies are created by the PA, we'll start to see the ability for companies to figure out if they want to be commercial CAs. Because in my opinion, I suspect with 2,000 telcos in the US, not all of them are going to have the ability to do this on their own. So I think we're going to have to have commercial entities, but they're not going to be able to figure out what that business is like until the rules have been defined. As far as a timeline itself, FCC wants all the major telcos doing it this year. That's going to be that peer-to-peer -peer exchanging of certificates. I really think that by next year will be the earliest that we even start to see what the framework looks like. I would not expect a very large percentage of the industry to be on board by next year. Then there's the global. How long will it take every other country in the world to do it? No idea. So a couple of critical things that we need. Um, obviously, we need all the carriers to figure out, are they going to participate? How are they going to do it? Uh, there's the technology approach, policies, the implementations of the PKI. Um, there's a lot of global issues. The interesting thing about the way Shake and Stir works is if you can't validate the caller ID, the call still goes through. It just gets flagged as unverified. So that means if 99% of the world has implemented secure caller ID, if I'm a bad actor, all I have to do is move my business to some telco who's sitting in that one lone country that hasn't implemented this yet, and my call will still go through and it will still be unflagged, but that's better than being flagged as spam. So wherever that weak point is in that global telecom structure, that's where the bad actors are gonna go. And they don't even physically have to be there. I could be sitting here using a provider in another country virtually. So those remaining countries have the potential to still affect the global basis if they allow those robocalls through their infrastructure. So a couple of technical things. This is stuff I haven't really shared with other people because they kind of start to nod off when we go much deeper on shake and stir but I uh, thought you guys might be interested in this. If you want to read up on this a little bit more, those ATIS documents are very easy to find. Uh, the standards are, I don't know, what, 1 million 84 um, and uh, 1 million 80 um, and, and the documents in between, as well as a uh, million 74. But beyond that, what you'll find, the entire uh, recommendation is around the elliptical curve. Um, and this is really from an efficiency standpoint, much faster to validate that cryptographic key size, much easier to transport. And that SIP header that's going to go between the uh, originating and receiving telco, the signing certificate is sent along with that, or not, not sent along, but its signing key is going to be signing that packet. If it's a much larger key, like an RSA key, that's that much more data, that much more transmit that we have to do. So elliptical curve. Interestingly enough, something not in the standard, and I had to ask one of the authors, is it elliptical curve all the way up and down the chain? No. I go, well, that's kind of silly. So uh, RSA uh, encryption keys at a higher level are acceptable, but the signing keys themselves, elliptical curve. Um, the other thing is each provider is going to have to be responsible for having the infrastructure to be able to go out to that certificate repository for every other uh, provider 
and retrieve those certificates to be able to validate a call. In the US with 2,000 telcos, if everybody was doing that, imagine a server that's doing this verification service, when it starts back up with no cached information, the first call from every originating telco, it's going to have to go out and retrieve that information. Go retrieve those signing certificates, the chain, and revocation information. The only way that this really works at scale is the fact that maybe the first call or two after that machine is rebooted goes through is unflagged. It retrieves the information and then caches it. It's not a giant number of certificates that would have to be cached, but it's something that's going to have to be built into that verification service. Uh, the other interesting thing here is uh, we work with PKIs all the time. Telcos are no different than most enterprises and governments. They struggle to do PKIs today. And that's just to get their users on the Wi-Fi networks and encrypt stuff. Now we're going to ask them to deploy PKIs to secure every telephone call they make. Um, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in that. A um, couple of telcos I've looked at have uh, one that comes to mind has nine different PKIs. Uh, simply because they can't ever figure out how to get rid of the one that they didn't quite do the right thing on and it's still sitting around. So they now have nine of them. Um, to now ask them on the, regula on the regulated operation side to deploy a PKI to secure my phone calls, I don't think it's going to happen. The other interesting thing is how they're going to do the enrollment and verification. All of this is designed to be automated very distinct from, say, getting a TLS certificate where you go to a website and you get an account and you buy your cert and you come back two years later. This is going to use some type of security token, still to be defined, I'm guessing some type of JSON token, that the policy administrator will give to each telco that says, hey, we've authenticated who you are. Use this when you go get your signing certificate. Well, that is then going to use ACME in a very unique way ACME is going to essentially say, if you've got an authenticated security token, we're going to let you get your signing certificate. So all of this still has to be created and defined. Again, it's not going to happen by the end of this year. So the SIP header itself, this is what we see in a uh, outgoing call. You may recognize some of this, but this is what it's going to look like with shake and stir uh, in place. In the header itself, you'll see that there's a signing algorithm that's specified. In this case, it's elliptical curve 256. And it's asserting the fact that there's a shaken token or a passport that's been defined. And one other thing that they're doing unique, that certificate repository that I said that was a little different than a normal PKI, this is where the chain and revocation information is going to be available. The signing certificate that was used to sign this header is going to be specified in the header itself. So rather than sending the certificate so it can be validated, the header goes across and the validation service will then go retrieve that certificate if it doesn't already have it in memory and use that key to validate the signature that was on the SIP header. Now the payload itself, what's actually in the call that's attesting to it, you can see that the payload is attesting to the call itself. There's a destination telephone number or TN and more importantly, we have the originator, the originating telephone. So this is the caller ID that's been inserted into the SIP payload by the telco itself. There's two other important things. There's originator ID, a GUID that will help the originating telco track that back to particular transactions and accounts. And the IAT is an encryption of date and time to prevent replay attacks. So the important technical stuff, things that you could go do to muck around with this stuff. Um, from a weakness perspective, like any kind of PKI, the biggest weakness is going to come from rushed, hurried, and bad deployments. Um, the fact that the calls themselves are designed to be attested um, but still go through if they can't be validated simply means um, many telcos may not have the greatest incentive to do this right and secure they could really look at this to say, hey, if we do a bad job, the call still goes through, things are flagged, we'll fix whatever we did and we'll just recover and move on to the next thing and make a nice commercial. So there's not a whole lot of incentive as opposed to saying, if you deploy your PKI and something goes wrong, we're not going to calls. So there's no provision that says we're not going to accept unattested calls. It simply means uh, the telcos have little in incentive to do it right. Um, the other thing is the fact that 
a lot of times when we talk about PKIs and we're working with organizations, we talk about the theory of compromise. Who's going to compromise your PKI? Who wants to get to your data? This is one place where I think there's going to be a lot of value around the human, the human engineering and technical ability to break a PKI. Because imagine a world where there's a lot of big business today behind robocalls. They're not doing it to spread the, the gospel of their religion or because they've got no one to talk to as friends. They're doing it because it's a business. Which means if there's a technology like shake and stir that threatens that business, there's going to be a value associated with being a business that still has the ability to make spam calls. And if you're that one company left in the world that's still able to make automated robocalls and you can charge a lot of money to do that because you're the only one that's doing it, now there's a distinct incentive to find that PKI that you can exploit. Is that finding some employee that I can bribe? Is it stealing information? Is it finding a weakness in someone's deployment? There's going to be a very clear financial incentive to go out and find out how to break this somewhere. The other challenge is PKI is tough. We, we deal with this all the time. It's not a technology where you can push a button and you've got a secure infrastructure. Almost everything we do is bespoke because every risk is different, every organization is different. Who do you trust, who don't you trust? Do you want two-person controls or are you just concerned about a rogue adversary? Are you trusting of your administrators? Do you need two data centers or three data centers of fault tolerance? Do you need fault tolerance within the data center? It's stuff that is difficult and takes a lot of deep subject matter expertise, but there's not a lot of it out there. With 2,000 telcos in the US and only 10 of them of considerable size, and what I mean by that, meaning an enterprise that's large enough that they probably have subject matter or money to make this happen, the rest are left to fend for themselves. And in fact, at the FCC summit, many of them were simply there to discuss their challenges and how the heck to deal with this new requirement. How are they going to implement this? The other interesting thing is the fact that uh, from an adversarial standpoint, things like a denial of service or direct attacks against the um, shake and stir framework, while it won't necessarily result in validated IDs without the theft of signing keys or something else, a denial of service does have one distinct advantage because um, calls still go through even if they're unverified, if I simply want my calls to start going through, I launch a denial of service attack, you can't validate information, but the call still goes through, as opposed to the fact that you are validating that my caller ID is this number that's blocked. So there's going to be a incentive to potentially find ways to break this simply so that your call gets marked as unflagged as opposed to spam or suspect. So there's uh, several areas that are likely to come up as issues here. A couple things before we go into questions. If anyone likes to geek out on PKI, uh, we are running a little thing. Um, we have an online PKI class. Uh, if you take a little snapshot, we have a little code called uh, DEF CON. So if you come up to our site, we're doing 50% off our training. Um, you know, it's just a way of, of trying to get more people to be aware of what the heck PKI is. Um, and, and frankly, the shake and stir space is something that is of interest to us, um, but we realize that there's going to be a need for a lot more people associated with the telco space or work space that are going to need to know PKI. Um, so hopefully this is something that will be available out there. So with that, I'll uh, open up the questions. All right, and if you could please line up behind the human microphone stand. <laughs> Come on up, everybody. And don't leave before the end of questions. I have one more thing. Well, here, I'll tell you now. Just in case anyone goes, I'll come right back to your question. Um, um, we're going to run a little crypto chat and drinks afterwards. Um, if you would like to come down, we're giving away drink tickets. You need to get a wristband from me, so I'll do that just on the other side of the partition when we're done with Q&A. I have 50 wristbands, but you get two drink tickets. Um, so there's a little bit of work. It's down at the Blue Moon Bar, uh, just down in the lobby. So we're gonna run that from six to eight with our partner, Key Factor. So if you wanna come talk some more uh, crypto, if you just wanna go get a Coke or a martini or a lemon twist or a lemon drop, whatever you want, that's okay too. But uh, we'll be around to talk crypto down there. All right, All right thanks. Th thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. Um, I am curious though, I uh, just went to Twilio's conference 
couple days ago. I think it's called Segment or Signal, something like that. And they actually showed a demonstration of this kind of implementation using their own stack. And I thought it was interesting that I think a common theme in your presentation was how inept bureaucracy is to do this. Uh, do you think it's likely that the companies like the Twilio uh, are going to be essentially implementing this for everyone? So the, the one good thing that's going here is the fact that the, the implementation and the day-to-day -day is, is really out of the government's control. So, so th there's some benefit there. Um, the fact that we've got uh, iConnective operating as that policy administrator, it's not bureaucracy on a day-to-day -day basis running it. Um, I don't necessarily think that every organization is going to do this the right way. In, in fact, I'm betting on it. Um, and I think that there's going to be mistakes. I suspect it's going to be commercial pressure that makes this happen. That, that really being, why are my calls not going through as validated? My business is, you know, telephony for hospitals. I'm going to move my business somewhere else. So I suspect, if anything, people are going to go kicking and screaming into this. It's going to be the commercial companies that are going to force them to do it. Great. That was that was actually what I think I saw at the conference too, because oh, yeah. DoorDash was like showing verified versus yeah. non-verified, and they had their yeah. logo on it and everything. It's and, and, there, neat. and you may even see some providers that say, you know what, we're just going to go for that bottom barrel. We're we're we're, we're just not even going to do it. We're going to keep our costs low, and they'll be the last ones to do it until they go. Okay, no no one's signing up right. because we're the only ones not doing this now. Cool. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'll probably go a little into the weeds with this. Um, how do you think this is going to affect uh, the toll-free side of all of this and places that use that as sort of their outbound number? Yep. So, so uh, ironically, that's where this concept of lemon twist comes from. So uh, the initial concept doesn't scale well for things like hospitals, government agencies, schools that have a large number of telephone numbers that may want all of their outgoing calls to be identified by a particular ID, which is, I think, what you're asking about. Uh, because today, that circuit comes in, it's going to get tagged with whatever number is associated with that. So the next stage of this uh, has a few names. Lemon Twist is, is one of those proposed standards. Uh, enterprise, shake and stir is what this typically gets referred to. And in that case, what we're talking about is accredited organizations, undefined what that means, but imagine City Hall, they would then have a signing certificate instead of the telco. So we're kind of going back to the model of the originator does the caller ID. They can then, on their PBX, have this signing certificate. So it has to come from a trusted source. But then they could say all of our outgoing calls are going to get flagged with this one static caller ID. Um, but how that gets attested, who gets that, how is that going to be kept secure, TBD. Uh, but they do see that that's going to be that next stage. And that's frankly why a lot of the commercial entities that are thinking about getting into the market selling certs, they see the market today as 2,000 certificates because one for each telco. But once we start talking about giant businesses, okay, now we're talking about a much larger um, uh, ecosystem that I could be selling the service into. And then how do you see fraud uh, basically? In <laughs> it, it's going to be rampant. Um, as soon as... Um, I, I, I don't necessarily think that we're going to see fraud directly from the telco side, from the initial shake and stir, because it's going to be in their incentive not to have a lot of fraud that's happening. The initial amount of fraud that we're going to see is somebody deliberately uh, breaking the implementation at the telco, um, the human engineering, some, something going on there. Once we get to the point where we're accrediting institutions, it's going to be kind of like, how do we know that you know, EV certs for websites are really going to the right organizations? And there's rules that are constantly evolving because people find new ways of exploiting it. So I think the biggest challenge is going to be, how the heck do we determine what that trusted organization is? And then how do we make sure it's secure there? And then how do we determine who's allowed to accredit no. Hi, this is City Hall. I want a signing certificate for my switch. Okay, great. How do I know you're really City Hall? So I, I think a lot of those things have to be figured out. Cool. Thank you. So, so my question is a little different. So your your talk today is it's interesting, but it sounds like you're saying that potentially this could be the death of the phone as well. Because if you look at, and I've been a phone guy. I was certified on. AT&T Definity, and I'm doing this 30-something years, and 
you know, in the early days of the phone, the phones were critical and the network was less critical. As over time, I've seen it where I can reboot the PBX in the middle of the day and nobody cared. Um, people don't even use the phones very often. Um, and so you sort of see in the home phone is basically disappearing, right? And, um, and so I sort of wonder, is it going to be enough in time to make it so that I really want to even bother answering my phone if it's not... I, I, th I think you're you're touching on a couple of interesting things there. One, one I, I think if nothing is done, the, the trust in telephony is just getting eroded. Um, so people are finding other sources to go to. Now, uh, my daughter doesn't not call me because she doesn't trust that I'm on the other side. She's just a Gen Xer and you know she, she'll text. So th there is a, a, a different use of telephony that's there. Um, I would also say a lot of businesses have evolved. So there's probably fewer businesses that rely direct um, on telephony and use other services like web and, and email to communicate. Um, but like the, the previous presenter was, uh, uh, was illustrating is a lot of businesses still interact with their consumers and their customers via telephony yeah. because in many ways that is the closest secure connection that they have to them. I want to hear your voice. I'm going to ask you some questions. So telephony may change. You know, the fact that it's all SIP and voice uh, based today, uh, but could it be um, conceivable in a couple of years that my bank will want me to use FaceTime or some other type of service to, to talk to them? Certainly. Well, because at the end of the day, it's not a lot of data for voice. I mean, you know, 30 years ago, it was considered significant. It, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a very low modulation. It's very easy to move around. Yeah. The old uh, system seven signaling systems that were in play when I was in the in telco side are all gone. Uh, so it's all digital. So the, it, it well, really it's not is all keeping... digital, though, right? Or it's, at least it's not all uh, IP based, right? Yeah, exactly. But it eventually winds up at some point being transmitted as IP somewhere. Um, so I, I think it's kind of like what we're seeing on, on the um, broadband side. You know, you're still getting broadband TV as kind of broadcast channels, but it's going over digital media. It, it, everything's kind of morphing. But I think telephony is going to have to come up with a better identity because it used to be you picked up the phone book. If you had a number, you knew who was going to be on the other end, and it just doesn't happen that way anymore. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in the shake and stir model with MVNOs, would they be required to implement their own certificates or would they be able to leverage the carriers that they're operating on? Sure. So that, that's kind of the, the framework that's envisioned. If I just back up here real quick, um, the concept would really be uh, if, there we go, there we go. Um, that the, the model was designed that uh, any organization that's either originating or receiving uh, calls could implement their own PKI, TBD on how that gets attested, or the fact that there could be a commercial provider that's out there. Um, when we look at things like the enterprise or that lemon twist variation where it would be the large organizations, the differing models are where do their signing certificates come from? Do they come from the telco or do they come from the, the policy administrator, like, like where that gets defined? Um, we know it would have to come from a trusted PKI. Um, I think we'll probably see that uh, technically any PKI could be operated by any of those players, but it would have to be attested and audited um, much like we would expect to see a web trust audit for a, a commercial CA doing you know, TLS certificates. Uh, but all that has yet to be defined. Hey, uh, one other space in telecom industry is the SMS messages. A lot of companies use it for multi-factor authentication and it is considered as a weakest link. There were a couple of attacks that happened earlier this year and last year as well. Is anything happening in that space to... Uh, uh, yeah, um, I, you, I, I think the, the interesting thing is um, I, I haven't seen anything specific to the shake and stir in that framework. So I, I don't think it was designed to do anything in there. Um, I think it's a little bit of a, um, a different problem. We don't tend to see on the SMS side too much of the impersonating of the sending of it. A, a lot of what we tend to see on the SMS is impersonating the receiver. So whether that's you know, sim jacking or something else where I'm trying to get myself in front of someone else by impersonating their sim or their number on my phone, it's almost kind of the opposite problem of what we're trying to do with shake and stir, where here's where we're trying to prove who the originator is. Well, in the case of a lot of the SMS attacks, we know it's the bank that's trying to reach the consumer. It's just that somebody's inserting themselves in the middle. Uh, so the tough part is how would the messaging structure have to change so that 
if I want to send an SMS, I, I would need some type of a relay mechanism that went back to the originator to say, I got to this thing, I was able to validate it somehow, and here's the proof. Um, I, I don't know of any frameworks that are directly okay. addressing that, uh, but that's probably why we're starting to see the use of other types of you know, two-way texting or other types of messaging Let's systems. See. And I think there's a, I haven't looked into it, but I know there's kind of a growing standard to replace SMS. I think Android just said they're going to start doing it, but I forget what it's called. Uh, you have another one? You need the last one? Oh, no, no. He's like, no, I don't want to hold it anymore. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, uh, I'm going to move to the other side of the partition. Some more questions and wristbands, and uh, I'll see you there. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much.